React India. Hi. So I'll just start by presenting my screen. Let's see if you should all be seeing it. Let me just start my slides. Okay, so hopefully now you should all be seeing my slides. And I would like to thank this talk, start this talk by thanking React India for having me one more time with you, in this case on the virtual stage. Last time I was there in person, I got to meet very and so many amazing people and I definitely miss it a lot, but well, unfortunately this year I won't be able to be there in person. So here I am with all of you to speak with this new talk that I'm trying out, which is actually going to be the first time that I'm going to be doing this talk. So hopefully you will all enjoy it. So let's start this thing, shall we? Okay, so here's an AI generated image. Um, super interesting how this thing turned out, but this image is here to represent something, attending conferences. And I can tell you that attending conferences can definitely be over overwhelming. There are so many words and topics that pop up nowadays, and not often we understand what they mean. Like sometimes we're in a conference, speakers, a set of speakers are giving very, very good insights, but sometimes you're hearing them say words that you recognize, but you don't know what they mean. And the issue for me, and this is actually something that has happened to me quite a quite time, is that I don't have the right mental models of them formed. Now, I don't know if you're aware what mental models are. I like to define mental models as the way or terms, images, and words that your brain and your mind associates with a certain subject. For instance, picture sleeping. Whenever you hear the word sleep, you immediately associate all the steps behind the act of sleeping. This is because you have the mental model of it formed and built in your mind. But eating pause on that, I just want to tell you all something about myself. I'm a huge comic book nerd. I have more comic books than I can read. And probably you might find me regularly making comic book and pop culture jokes in my day to day. And thinking of that, one day I thought, what if I could use the characters and all the things that I love, which in this case, comic books and tech, which are like the two loves on my life. Um, what if I could use them and get the technical concepts that I still miss the mental models and I built a nerdy guide to the web trending concepts. So this is going to be the essence of this talk of what we're going to be seeing. But before we start into it, let me just introduce myself. I am Daniel Fons. I'm working as a developer advocate at OLX. I'm an AGED.io instructor, Altair ambassador, and you can find me on this thing called X now, apparently, and any social media at the end of Daniel J.C. Fons. Also, something about me, I recently published a book called State Management with React Query. So if you love React Query or want to learn more about it or tips and tricks to managing server state in React, then please, this is something to, to reach out. And if you have questions about it, you can also reach out to me. It's pretty much available at any uh, online store. Now, just one quick disclaimer before we start this talk. It will include some fan-made stories using characters that, that are owned either by DC or Marvel Comics. So just something to put out there because I don't own these characters and I don't want no one to, to complain about this. So just a disclaimer. And start going from the disclaimer to sharing some love. I want to thank you, these amazing people. One of them you might actually recognize from the previous talk, Mateusz, and the other one is, is Attila. Thank to both of them because throughout the process of building this talk, and believe me, this has definitely been one of the trickiest talks that I built in a couple of years. They were there to support me, to give me feedback on the mental models that I want to build on all of you. So thanks to Attila and thanks to Mateusz, because this talk would probably wouldn't be the same without all of you. So let's review what the heck is going to happen here, because for this talk, we're going to cover four terms. We're going to cover hydration. We're going to cover edge computing. We're going to cover fine grain reactivity. And finally, we're going to end with resumability. So what's going to happen on this talk is for each of these terms, if we were in person, I would let you choose a character. And for each character, there's going to be a custom comic book story that I built. I wrote this thing. I took some time to write this, animate it properly. Hopefully, you'll be able to see all the cool animations. And during this story, something will happen that will set up the mental models that you need to learn for each of these specific topic. And after we wrap up the story, I will review what, I, what we saw, what are the technical and technical aspects of the topics that we are learning. And hopefully by the end of it, you'll have the mental model for these four things built in your mind. If you already know them, then 
you have something to enjoy because hopefully the stories are as fun and as engaging them as I try to build them. So let's start with hydration. Like I said, considering this is an online talk, we won't have time to have a vote for character choose, but so we'll go with Marvel on all the topics. So here we'll start with Iron Man. Okay, let's get ready for the story. Uh, during the story, I'll be assuming the narrator aspect of it. So I'll be narrating what's happening and hopefully you won't get bored of listening to me talking about this. So after building Mark One, Mark Two and Three by hand, Tony Stark didn't want to repeat the process of building an armor by himself. This is because doing so was quite a slow process. It takes time. It should be faster, but and this is what he was aiming for. So he thought, maybe I can reprogram Friday, his custom AI, to know all the steps for building a new armor. And this would probably save him some time because then he could delegate the process of building to his manufacturing and to Friday. And so he did. All that was left was to ask Friday to build a new armor. Friday, build me a new armor, he asked. And Friday replied, obviously, we'll do, Tony. And so Friday activated the manufacturer and started to work. And as you can see, after a bit, the armor was ready. The armor was finally, finally ready. And so Tony went ahead and said, OK, let's get into this suit. Let's give it a run. And he tried. But apparently, something didn't quite work out. The suit didn't even open. And this left Tony to think. He was just sitting there with a non-interactive suit, thinking for a bit, what the heck should I do? Until something popped up into his mind. What if? What if he downloaded Friday to the armor? And then Friday would be able to power it up from the inside. After all, Friday knows how to build the armor. So then probably Friday will be able to power it up. So he did it as well. He started the download process. And after a bit, the download was completed. The armor had now Friday running on it. So once Friday started up, it started powering up the armor from inside. As you can see, there are lights starting on each part of the armor. And yeah, this is pretty much what Friday did. It powered the armor as it did a system, the boot check on each on each part of the armor. And now finally the armor was ready. Finally, Tony was able to wear the suit and go for a test run. So he powered up his thrusters. And apparently not every time things go right at the first. So this was the story that we have just learned for understanding how hydration works. So let's recap what's hydration and how it fits in the context of this story. So first thing here is that hydration is something that was created to solve the problem where server-side rendered code not having any sorts of interactivity. So the way this thing works is whenever our server generates HTML, it's pretty much state static HTML, the client gets this static HTML. But this means that because it's just static stuff, there's no interactivity to it. So what the this client needs to do now is download the JavaScript, run this JavaScript, which is going to be pretty much the framework, and then run what it's called the reconciliation process. In this reconciliation process, the framework is going to go over the static HTML and attach um, the event handlers and all the interactivity needed to run this thing. So after the reconciliation, finally, we can click on it. And this is in the gist what uh, hydration does. So let's recap how does this fit into the story. When we started, Tony had an issue, which was client-side rendering was slow because he was doing everything by hand. So Tony, he was classified as the client of this story. So then he thought, maybe I can program my framework to build the page because the framework knows how to build it on the client. So on the server, by using the, the framework, the server built the new state static HTML. But now we had another issue, which was once the client got the static HTML, it was not interactive because the server only generated the static part of it. There was no interactivity on this thing. So what's the solution? What if we get the framework on the client to turn the static HTML into interactive HTML? So on client downloads the framework. And once we get the framework, we need to wait it to start up. And once the framework does, she, the framework goes over the HTML and attach the event handlers and pretty much any logic needed to run every matching node. And given that, the page is now fully interactive. And this wraps up hydration. 
pretty much it all in five minutes or so so we just wrapped up the first story let's settle in because now we're going to learn a bit more about edge computing once again let's go with marvel so let's pick nick fury on this scenario if we were picking you could also pick a mandalore but in this case all nick fury so on this on this story i'll be assuming the role of nick fury and he's onboarding us to shield so new agents welcome to shield don't forget your goal to defend the earth before we continue i just have one story to you which is when the agency started our base was located in new york but as we grew and we worked on our goal we soon found one issue we could not get to every incident as fast as we wanted to it takes time to cross to the other points of the world and not to mention that there's cost of mobilizing all of our resources. So this meant that we often found ourselves at incidents right as they had been progressed more than we want to. And we have to, we have to wonder, how do we fix this? And we soon noticed a pattern. And it was, well, Wakanda as Black Panther. Let Viria as Doctor Doom. Heck, Krakoa as Professor X and Attilan as Black Bolt. And we run some statistics, we understand what happened. And what happens was they had a faster time to response than us. Apparently by being in the area when an issue happened, they could get there faster and respond faster than we ever did. What's the reason to that? Exactly, they were closer to, to the issue than we did. So how did we fix it? Because yeah, we fixed the issue. We fixed it by adding bases nearby the, these areas. What did, the, what did this relate and what were the gains that we had for this? Well, pretty much right now we have more bases around the world than we can count. But there's something that changed because now we are the first on site. This means that now we can get there before the local heroes get there. And it means that they are free to help in larger threats to the world than we are. In the case we still need help from the headquarter, it's cheaper because now our agents on site already did some research. And this also means that we will only send people we need instead of an all hands on deck situation like we need to have before. With that said, agent, you're assigned to the carbon base. Good luck and make us proud. And that was the gist for edge computing. Did you catch all the um, all the mentions of stuff? So let's see what's happening here and what's the issue and what the edge computing fixes. So the first thing that happens here is that there's an issue with cloud computing, which is it can be expensive and induce some latency. And picture scenarios that sometimes we need a split second decisions. Sometimes going to the cloud can impact this significantly. So what did we do? We introduced edge. The edge are places geographically closer to the device, to the edge device, the device where we need to do the computing or processing or whatever. And because they are geographically close, it's faster to go to the edge than going to the cloud. And the edge is responsible, can do data capturing, data storing, analysis, processing, and if so, can also send these things to the cloud. So it's cheaper most, most of the times to go to the edge faster, and we can narrow down the data we send to the cloud if we need to go to the cloud, because in some scenarios, don't even need to go there. Just to visualize this example, imagine that we have our server there. And every time we needed some data, we need to do this round trip from these computers. As you can see, it can be quite a, um, a long process. By using the edge, we have these things, these edge nodes distributed around the world. And whenever we need our data, our computers or edge devices can go to these um, edge parts instead of going to the, the actual server. And this saves latency, saves costs. And like I said, even if we still need to send data to the computing, uh, to the um, cloud computing, right, or do stuff on the cloud in this case, the edge nodes might have already done some processing. So let's see and let's recap how this fits into the story. So first thing is cloud computing can be expensive and induce latency. That's what we started, what we saw here. It took time to shield to be on the same time as to be on the same place as zeros. And when they got there, it already, something has been happening. And not to mention that it was more expensive because they had to go from one base to the entire place of the world. In this case, we can consider the initial headquarter of Shield as the cloud, um, the cloud servers, pretty much. Then they started thinking, getting data from the edge is faster from the cloud. The reason was because these local heroes were closer 
to the place where the incidents was happening were happening. So here we can classify the incidents as the um, as the the edge device and um, the euros. Pretty much here would could, we could consider them as the as the edge nodes. So what happened afterwards? Or oh, in this case, we can classify it as the and just and an in something here. The edge can be the user computer, can be an IoT device, and the edge server. This part it was not very represented here, but pretty much it, it's just here for all to want you to understand that the edge can be a very shallow thing to understand. In technical aspects, can be your computer, it can be an IT, IoT device, can be a CDN, can be pretty much anything. And on this example the edge were the new bases that the that shield created and by having this new edge uh, bases they were closer to the to the edge device to the device the device that needed this data so they were faster to get there and to interact with them and to save them whenever an issue happened and it also meant that if they had to go to the cloud they would only send processing or do processing that they actually needed instead of sending everything back there like they did before so that's pretty much how this thing happened. And so we just saw edge computing as well. So let's get ready to jump to another story, which is going to be fine-grained reactivity. Now, here you could choose from two of them, again, Watu or Batman. But like I said, we're going all Marvel here. So let's start and let's get introduced to the watchers. I'll get back to my narration voice. Hopefully, it will be OK. Let's do this, this thing. OK, the watchers, seers of everything, knowers of all that has passed or is to pass. The watchers contain time points and time derivations in what it's called the Cyclopedia Universum. Now, what are these time points and time derivations, you might ask? Well, time points are, the, as the name might incline, points in time where critical events in history happen. Now, sometimes the watchers need to understand what might have might happen to these time points if there's some external interference, inter interference. So they called something that they are called time derivations. Now, time derivations are a complex thing to calculate. They are track harder to track. So they have a process where they are dependent, and these time derivations are dependent on the original time points, but and they only change when something change pretty much to the original time point uh, but, but because they are harder to calculate they are stored individually in these capsules of time derivation and only recalculated at times hopefully that was <laughs> simpler to understand now the watchers have one established rule and this established rule is to always watch track what happens inside each time point but never interfere with them one of the members of the watchers is called watu now, Watu got a particular interest in a set of time points that belonged to Earth 616. And every time a single time change happened to these time points, Watu would feel it. Helpless to do anything, he suffered. Now, for eons, he endured the suffering until one day. One day, Watu found the last point on Earth 616, the last time point. Well, if you probably figured it out, this meant that was the end of everything on this timeline. Curious, Watu checked the time point. He watched into it and saw what happened. Well, Galactus happened. He had went rampage and completely had obliterated that hurt and a couple of other ones around. This cannot be, Watu thought to himself. I need to do something. And so he did. That day, Watu guided the Fantastic Four to the ultimate nullifier. And for the first time ever, a Watcher interfered. He broke their rule. That day, Watu changed the time point. Once he did so, the Watchers knew it. The time point changed, and the time derivations associated with that time point were recalculated just to understand where everything would go on the timeline eventually. Now, what happened next, you might be thinking. Well, the rest, the rest is history. If you want to know where this thing goes on, you can check the comic book Fantastic Four, fifth, issue 50 from 1961, because pretty much what we saw here all leads up to this issue. So we just saw fine grain reactivity with the help of the Watchers and with a bit of the help of history of comic books. Now, 
Before we step on what fine grain reactivity, let's break this subject apart and let's just start with reactivity. Now, reactivity is defined as a programming pattern that lets you set a behavior that will automatically react to data changes. So whenever something happens, there's a reaction to it. Fine grain reactivity is pretty much a way where you can implement this pattern by using a network of primitives. And these primitives are signals, effects, and memos. Now, the way this thing is built is that these primitives allow the framework to know exactly where the update needs to happen. And this allows the framework to avoid running any code to determine updates. So one of the very good examples of fine grain reactivity is SolidJS. Pretty much there's no need for VDOM there because when you render the component once and thanks to fine grain reactivity, only when a signal changes, that the associated DOM node will change to it. So just so you can visualize this, let's picture an example. Here we have an example of a signal. The way we are writing is creating a signal is by hitting create signal. Oh, just by the way, to the definition of signals, signals are event emitters with getters and setters and they hold a value. And pretty much that's the gist of how signals work. So here we have a create signal that's gonna hold the value zero. It returns the count, which is a getter for it and a set count, which is the setter for it. This signal is associated with a DOM to our DOM node because we're calling it there. And this means that every time this signal changes, our DOM node and only the DOM node associated with will be recreated with it. Now, for this to work, we need something else, which is called effects. Now, effects are functions that subscribe to signals. And every time a signal changes, it will be executed. This effect executes. So there are two ways we can create signals, uh, signals effects in solid. In this case, we have the implicit and the explicit one. So the explicit is when we say, okay, create an effect. And the way that solid works is because we have a signal inside of this effect, which is our counter, this effect will only run whenever this count change. And there's no need for dependency arrays here because uh, solid will do automatic dependency, uh, dependency checking. So this means that this effect will depend on count and every time count changes, the log will run. But there's also an implicit uh, effect running here. Remember when we have that count under there where we can see our count? Well, this is an implicit e effect because this means that every time our counter change, Solid will run an effect that will react to this signal change and update the DOM on this specific part. So there are two ways to have signals here on Solid. So just something to keep in mind. And the third primitive that we have here are memos. So memos allow to cache the right values. So the way this works is imagine that we have an example like we have here where we are run calling the double num function a bunch of times. Now. If double num here is a very simple function, so it's not very heavy, but imagine that it, this was a very heavy process to run. Every time we called this thing, it would rerun. Well, by wrapping the double num function with create memo, this create memo will subscribe with, to our count signal. And we'll, what we'll do pretty much is we'll return the result of it. And every time we call the double num, it won't recalculate itself, it won't call it again because we already have this thing cached. Only once our signal changes that this thing changes. So let's review how these topics filled into the, the story that we just learned. Well, we started to learn about time points and time derivations. Well, time points in this case were signals because they contained a time, in point in time, which in this case can be a value. And then we had time derivations, which were derivations of time points, but they are heavy to calculate. So they are what can be memos. Now, a couple of other things happened. Remember, every time something happened to a timeline and to a time point, the watchers were notified. So pretty much there are effects that were running. But mostly what the watchers were doing, they were logging that thing. So it was, you can classify the first three effects that we saw here as just some console logging of sort. But once Watu decided to do something to avoid this thing was when he, he actually did an effect which was gonna change a, a time point, uh, in this case, a signal. So this effect would probably call a set something to our time point. Once the time point changed our signal, the watchers got notified. I don't know if you were able to notice, but there was an animation where they all sh shook the, because, and there was a rotation on the big sphere, which is a time point, time point. So the time point changed, the watchers got notified and there was also another animation to the time derivations because they got recreated as well. And that's pretty much fine grain reactivity in a story. And now let's add up to the last point that we have here, which is 
resumability, and this will be the one that will close this talk. Now, resumability, because we're following a bit on the steps of hydration and we're gonna deal with the effects of hydration, we'll still have the same characters. So for the sake of it, let's continue with Iron Man. So after the last fight with Kang the Conqueror, Tony took a big hit. He completely ran out of armors. They all broke down because you see that stuff that happens in fights. So Tony had got home and he went to sleep. He was super tired. And as he was heading to bed, he asked Friday, Friday, remind me to build new Mark suits tomorrow. And so he fell asleep. Yeah, you see, saving the world <laughs> is a tiring thing and Tony deserved this sleep so, so much. But suddenly, an explosion happened. You see, the Mandarin cannot let this opportunity slide. After all, this was a vulnerable Tony Stark. He had just fought, fought a massive enemy and he had no armors. This is a right opportunity to attack. So Tony woke up startled and he shouts, okay, I need a suit. But Tony knew something. The current process that he has is not good. He could get the manufacturing running and have Friday build the armor, but very much he wouldn't probably wouldn't have time to download Friday to the suit. And this could probably very much mean death to him. And as some hydragoons show up, Tony forces himself to think. Think, Tony, think. I need an armor ready to work. Friday, initiate resumable protocol. Build me a suit now. And so Friday switched into this new protocol. And in the manufacturing room, it started to build a new suit. But this time the process changed. You see, for every part of the suit that would be interactive, Friday would encode this information there. Friday would also encode the pointer to would indicate to itself, because Friday would be already uploaded into this armor, it would indicate to itself where to find the instructions to operate the specific part whenever the time arrived. And so on. In the meantime, Tony found himself surrounded by the Mandarin and its goons. And as you saw, and something happens in many comic books and comic book movies, Mandarin started his bad guy monologue. At the end of it, he points his hand to Tony and gets ready to fire his disintegration beam. And as he does this, Tony jumps and he gets caught by his new build suit, which saves him for a sure death blast that would thing would that be. How? The Mandarin shouts. Yeah, he, he knew about the weaknesses of the previous process that Tony had. He knew that there's no way he could get an armor that fast. You see, something changed because Tony activated the resumable protocol. What happened was whenever, when Friday created the armor, it already uploaded a very, very small part of itself into the suit. And this small version of Friday was able to intercept and, 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 and any command from Tony. And by using the encoding instructions on the armor, it would be able to figure out on the fly how to execute each specific instruction. This means that the armor didn't need any boot slash system check phase. And so on the armor, Tony said, Friday, fire the rockets. Inside the armor, he heard Friday saying, powering the rockets, Tony. Once the rockets were ready, Tony fired them. And in the process, <laughs> Tony collapsed the entire house and everything inside. This ensured that Tony could escape the Mandarin and call for him back for backup. Now, what next? Well, for that, you can wait for the next issue which will eventually come out. Welcome to the world of comic books. And so we just learned about resumability. Let's see how this thing happened and how it works. Now, resumability is there to solve an issue, with, which was an issue with hydration, which was when we are getting a server-side rendered page, the page is not immediately interactive. And once we're doing hydration, we are redoing the work we did on the server. Because remember, the framework needs to re-execute so it can attach all the event uh, handlers and all the things to have the page interactive. Obviously, no hydration is better than having some sort of hydration. The way this thing works is on the server, when um, using the framework, the server generates the static HTML. But it adds already some encoded information. It serializes, serializes some data in it. So that whenever we get the page, we can already click on it. The page is immediately interactive. Now, we don't need to download all the JavaScript and all the framework because whenever we get the page, you also get a very, very small portion of the framework, which is called the quick loader. And this thing is going to intercept the, um, the, um, the, the, um, the event and get the JavaScript needed to only execute this thing. So resumability got very popular in this case by the framework called Quick. 
therefore me mentioning the quake order. Now let's see how this thing applies to the talk that we just saw and the examples. So in this issue that we have, we Tony figured out, okay, hydration is slow. And he had the need for a new suit. So he requested a new page, but in this case, we are already using resumability. What happened was on the server, the framework, um, this, when the, ser the server was started to do the um, build a page by using the framework, the framework would serialize in all the information it needs to resume its ex execution in new environment. So this pretty much means that whenever the framework is generating the um, server-side rendering the code, it pretty much stops the execution, grabs all the information that it needs, and sends it back to the client. So once the client gets the page, it's immediately interactive. Now, here the client also gets something, which I mentioned already, which is the quick loader. And this quick loader, what it's going to do is set up a global listener to all events. This means that whenever the user wants to do something, when an event happens, the quick loader will intercept that thing, get download the JavaScript it, it needs to run it. So pretty much only the JavaScript it needs instead of downloading everything and runs that code. And that's pretty much it. We reached the, the end of the talk. Now you might be thinking, okay, what comes next? What's the next topic? What do we want to learn more? Well, I would like to hear that from you. If you enjoyed the concept of this talk, if you have some topics that you would like me to get into and help you build the mental models to it, please let me know because I had a ton of fun building this thing and I want to do more. For the rest of you at home and or wherever you are at work, whatever, thank you so much for attending and please stay tuned for the next adventures because this was a nerdy guide to the web branding concepts. I've been Daniel Alphonse. Thank you so much for having me. Have a good day.